the bad, we really don't. I mean, there are troubles in our nation here in the 21st century, big troubles, but imagine growing up as a Christian in fascist Germany during the Nazi era when it was, well, it wasn't illegal to be a Christian, but it was certainly frowned upon to be a Christian, and confessing Christians had to, well, they had to take a stand against Nazism, not only for civil reasons, but for religious reasons as well. We're going to be hearing the story of one man growing up in Nazi Germany and later in communist East Germany. Dr. Uwe Simonetta will join us. Greetings and welcome to Issues Etc. live on this Friday afternoon, September the 10th. I'm Todd Wilkin. Thanks for tuning us in. After our conversation with Dr. Simonetta, we will go through listener email and the Issues Etc. comment line, that email address, talkback at issuesetc.org. And the comment line, 618-223-8382. Then, since it's Friday and the end of a broadcast week, we'll play Issues Etc. Soundbite of the Week. You can vote in advance at our Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash Issues ETC. Send us a tweet with your vote at Issues ETC. Use that email, talkback at Issues ETC.org, or wait and give us a call, one 623 my ie Joining us to talk about growing up in Nazi Germany and communist East Germany, Dr. Uwe Simonetto, he's a native of Germany, former religion editor for United Press International, founder and emeritus director of the Center for Lutheran Theology and Public Life, and author of a new book, Urchin at War, The Tale of a Leipzig Rascal and His Lutheran Granny Under Bombs in Nazi Germany. Uwe, welcome back. Thank you. You traveled back to your birthplace in Germany for the writing of this memoir. Tell us about that. Well... Uh, you know, for a long time under communist rule, I was banned from Leipzig for going back there because at first they, they accused me of uh, treason during the construction of the Berlin Wall, 61, which I covered and uh, they didn't like my methods. And then I was threatened with arrest. Then because of um, when I was, finally was allowed back, I was banned because it was so unfriendly to the communist regime. So I was banned. So now for the first time I had an opportunity for a longish visit to Leipzig because a local newspaper asked me uh, to write a 10-part series on my childhood in Leipzig, on wandering through Leipzig, then reflecting back on my childhood there under the Nazi rule and what it was like and then when the Americans came and then the Russians, etc. And so I, I arrived there stayed in a hotel very, very, very close to the place in, it's called now Shakespeare Square Platz or Shakespeare Square, where I was born. That's in downtown Leipzig. and was exactly 150 steps from the address where I was born was a hotel. And I opened the windows and Leipzig has a very, very uh, special smell in the air. It's very fragrant. It's linden trees. Lots of linden trees. In fact, the word Leipzig means Linden City. Uh, that's the Sorabs, where Slavic, Western Slavic uh, tribe th- that inhabited that area about a thousand years ago. And then I wondered about the odor of linden trees and of bear love and, and, and all this thing. It's a fantastic smell if you if you're used to it. I, I, I just breathed it in and enjoyed it. And then, of course, the reflections came very, very quickly because, of course, this is where I was bombed out in 1943 with my parents and we had to move into my grandmother's house further south, about two miles south of there. I hope you have a chance to describe this a little bit because it was rather dramatic. I had to guide my blind father. My father was blinded in World War I in combat. Uh, I had to guide him through puddles of green flames because the Brits had dropped uh, phosphor on us and phosphor produces green flames. And our house was burning, burned out. While my mother stayed behind and foolishly tried to extinguish the flames with water, you can't extinguish uh, phosphor fire with water. You need sand for that. But then Leipzig is not a not a seaside city. So I took my father. We hopped over, and I, I actually laughed when it happened because very funny. He was a, a little rascal. I was then seven years old, and I told my father in Saxon, 
hop here, hop there. And he said, speak high German, and because he was a North German. And uh, I said, no, I'm in charge here. I speak Saxon. And so in, in the end, he laughed himself. And so um, in my book, I then uh, reflect on my school, which my father was a, was a prosecutor for juvenile delinquency. So his courthouse was on one side, and opposite the courthouse was my school, and both burned. And then, you know, then I arrived at my grandmother's, and um, we were waiting now for my mother, because and then we arrived there at 5 o'clock in the morning. And my grandmother, being a good Saxon granny, the first thing she did was she went into the kitchen and started grating potatoes for potato pancakes. That is the ultimate comfort food for a Saxon kid. And then we waited and waited and waited and were more and more worried about my mother because she tried to extinguish the flames and, of course, didn't succeed. And then finally, three or four Frenchmen arrived with an apple cart. You know the kinds of apple carts you had in this country, too? New York, for example, big wheels, wooden wheels, and you, you food salesmen, food vendors roll them through the streets of New York or the big cities in this country. Well, we had those, too. And my mother was on it, by now unconscious, and as it turned out, blind as well, but that was only temporarily. It was from the smoke inhalation, but she was unconscious. But she was clutching our 17th century family Bible on her belly. And uh, I could speak French, a little French already, because I had had prior to that a French nanny. And uh, I asked these French, my father didn't speak French, he spoke English, and my grandmother's French was very rusty. So I had to translate for my grandmother what had transpired here. And um, these guys who were indentured laborers from France, I mean, the Germans, of course, needed workers because the German men were in, in, in combat. So there were lots of French people there. They had the freedom of the city. They could walk about. They lived in a former Union house. And somehow, mysteriously, they came rushing. When after after it was the all clear was out, they came rushing out, saw the burning city that night. 1,500 people had been killed in Leipzig. And I think 80% of the buildings damaged or destroyed. So, and they stormed up the burning staircase to my mother, to our apartment, and my mother, who was a singer, lay in her concert room. We had a very large concert room with a wonderful grand piano, Blüthner grand piano, and she lay under the piano, unconscious, clutching the Bible. And the Frenchman said, Madame, il est fort temps de partir. It's high time to leave. And my mother wakes up and says, uh, Mais d'abord, il faut que je vous fasse un café, but first I have to make you a coffee. Imagine the whole bloody building is burning. The uh, pictures of our ancestors are being eaten up by flames going back to the 16th century. And my mother said, well, first of all, we, uh, we Saxons drink a lot of coffee. We have, I make your coffee because there was still electricity there. She had the immersion heater, but there was no water, so she had mineral water. And she tried to make coffee, but at that time, in neighboring rooms of our apartment, my bedroom and my, and my father's room, the ceilings came bursting and fire was spread all over the apartment. And uh, the Frenchman just grabbed my mother on her shoulder, ran with, him, with my mother on her back down those the burning staircase, which was immensely risky because, I mean, the staircase was about to collapse, and then brought her to my grandmother. So that is, these were memories, uh, my first wartime memories. What is your first memory of the Nazi regime in Leipzig? Well, you know, the interesting thing about Leipzig was it was, of course, the least Nazi city in all of Germany. So the atmosphere... As such, was not very pro-Nazi and was relatively free for a relatively long time. 
Leipzig was the mayor of Leipzig, former mayor of Leipzig was, of course, the civilian leader of the resistance, anti-Nazi resistance in Germany. And he wasn't not a Johnny candidate. He, he, he started his resistance movement back in, in 1934, immediately, almost immediately after the Nazis had gained power. Uh, his name was Karl Gerdler. And he was, he sort of typified especially, if you will, my class of Leipzigers, the sort of higher bourgeois, educated, university educated bourgeoisie. So there was, it wasn't as oppressive at first when I was a child, except a couple of things. I noticed that, for example, Hitler was never mentioned in my house, although we knew, of course, from the streets, talking to other kids, playing in the streets, that the Nazis were in power, and we had uh, Jungfolk as the junior branch of the Hitler Youth in uniforms traipsing about, but not at home. But then a couple of things occurred. We had a factotum. His name was Adolf Bodenstein. He was the descendant of a dynasty of wine merchants going back to the 15th century. Uh, but he had uh, blown all his money and sought shelter in my grandparents' home. And my grand- grandfather hired him as a factotum and his wife as, as my, my, my grandmother's hairdresser every morning. But he was a, an absolute loser. And then all of a sudden... When the Nazis came to power, he was his first ever job was as a, a Nazi pen pusher. So he, here he was in a brown uniform with his leather strapped clear across the chest, jack boots, brown jack boots, highly polished, and he strutted about and did nothing and grew fatter and fatter by the moment. And one day, when my father was in court and my mother was out shopping or that somewhere, and uh, it was only the maid, this, this French woman who was actually my, my nanny, uh, with me. And Bodenstein stood in full grandeur of fatness in the door with a bunch of flowers and said to Ramond, the French woman, give me Uber. And uh, Ramond said, no, monsieur, I have no right to do that. I'm absolutely forbidden to hand over to anybody other than members of the family or staff. And I remember this guy grabbing Ramon, who was a sweet little young woman from Amiens in northern France, and slamming her against the wall. She collapsed crying. She hurt a lot. And then he grabbed me and pressed this bunch of flowers into my hand, then <laughs> took me around the corner to Adolf Hitlerstrasse, which was one of the main thoroughfares of Leipzig. You see, the, the so called Via Imperii, one of the two historical trade routes of antiquity which crossed in Leipzig and were, which made Leipzig famous as the world's first international trade fair about a thousand years ago. And there were masses of people swinging swastika flags and all that, and they expanded the parade, and then came big convoy of big Mercedes and Horsch limousines, and there was one guy standing next to the driver with his arms stretched out in the Hitler salute, and Adolf Factotum, thrust me to the car and into this guy's arms, asking me to hand him the flowers. And uh, then we went home, and um, my father at lunch asked me, as usual, uh, so Uwe, what happened to you this morning? And then he, uh, I burst out, well, der Führer stinkt. He had very strong body odor. And he said, what's this nonsense? I lived under the impression until very recently when I researched this this event that I, I, I was kissed by Hitler. 
But actually, it, it wasn't. It wasn't Hitler because Hitler came to Leipzig only once. We discussed a little later Hitler's attitude towards Leipzig. Um, he hated that city with, with passion. Um, uh, he came once and stayed only for a couple of hours and then and, and rushed back to Berlin. This was the Gauleiter, whose name was Mutschmann. I mean, the Gauleiter was a sort of uh, regional governor of the Nazi party. Uh, a big shot, you know. And his name was Mutschmann, and we uh, Saxons called him King Mu. And uh, it was evidently this guy who, who, who had strong body odor. Quite sure Hitler um, uh, had even stronger odors because he suffered from permanent flatulences, you know. So that was that. So that was my first experience. And then, oh yes, and then, uh, then my mother looked at um, Raymond, who was serving our meal. And she had a black eye, and she was uh, her whole face was screwed up. And she said, well, Ramon, what happened to you? And, and, and she wouldn't answer. And so my mother asked me, and then I told her that this, this Nazi guy had slammed her against the call. I called her a French slut. So my father, from that day, banished this guy, Bodenstein from our apartment. His wife worked for us in the, in the kitchen. Uh, she was allowed in, but his uh, husband um, had no uh, access. And he took revenge on us badly when we were bombed out, refused to help us uh, rescue our, our things, some of our valuables and all that thing. But that was one thing about the Nazis. You must understand that in, in, in a typical what we call in German Bildungsbürgertum, uh, this educated bourgeoisie. In a typical home of that, we lived in two universes. We were blocked. The Nazi ideology and Nazi names and, and that sort of stuff were absolutely blocked at our front door. They didn't come in. I was not, we, were, we were, did not discuss Hitler, we did not, uh, at least at, uh, in, in, in those early years, we did not discuss Hitler, we did not discuss the Nazis, we just didn't, period. So now, one day, we sat again at lunch, and um, suddenly the doorbell rang, and again, Ramon was uh, uh, serving, and my father said, well, you go to the door and open up and see what it is. And here stood, again in Nazi uniform, the block warden, I think her name was Kretschmer. And she demanded that my father come to the door. And I said, well, I'm sorry, you can't speak to my father. We are having lunch. Because you must understand that in, in, in the one thing the Nazi movement was, was actually not a right-wing movement, it was a left-wing movement. It was full of envy, class hatred. They despised the aristocracy. They despised the, the uh, upper bourgeoisie, the people with university degrees in Leipzig, with its famous university. We had a lot of academics around. The Nazis just hated us, these people. Uh, the Nazis, by and large, of course, there were exceptions, but by and large, they were lower middle class, not working class, lower middle class people. So low-ranking postal clerks and that sort of thing. So he uh, finally, my, he insisted and made a hell of a noise. And finally, my father comes, I have to, had to lead my father. I said my father was blind. And uh, he said, Her doctor, do you know what day it is? My father said, well, whatever day it is. I said, yes, that's, that's the day. No, I mean, he said, what date is it? I said, my father, the 20th of April. Yes, and what does that mean to you and every German patriot? My father said, I have no idea. Well, it's Hitler's birthday, the Führer's birthday. Uh-huh. Okay, well, congratulations to him. Pass it on. My father was a very sharp tongue, you know, it's sort of a very dry North German sense of humor, sort of like a British sense of humor. And so he said, yeah, but you don't show respect for the Fuhrer. Well, how would you? Well, you don't have this swastika flag out, and that's true. Well, we have a flag out, he says. Yeah, but the flag we had out was the 
flag of the kingdom of Saxony to which we belonged. Of course, King said the king of Saxony was a grand guy, uh, had long left Leipzig and died in the meantime, but of course he had to leave his throne in, in 1919. So my father said, well, I'm sorry, but he said, yeah, but it's the law. I said, well, no, wait a minute. He said, I also have, I can, I can offer you the old imperial flag of Germany. That's in our colors. What colors? Well, black, white, and red. These were the imperial colors. Yeah, but that's not a complete Nazi uh, party flag meaning the swastika. My father said, it's black, white, and red. For these colors, I went to war in 1914, and for these colors, I lost my eyesight. Please, so behave yourself. Let me finish my meal. So um, anyway, this, this went on and was very threatening. And then my father said, to, well, if you can have a complaint, then complain to the district attorney of Leipzig. <laughs> the district attorney of Leipzig was a very anti-Nazi, as were his staff. My father was a senior member of the district attorney's staff. So he went. But again, this guy took revenge by not helping us with our furniture and our things out when the apartment burned. So that was the rest. So these were the first impressions of the Nazis. Of course, there were more later, but that was the first one. Dr. Uwe Simonetto is our guest. We're talking about him growing up in Nazi Germany and communist East Germany. When we come back, why did Hitler despise Leipzig and its inhabitants? The Church's Music from the 20th Century. The 17th century. The 11th century. The 8th century. The 4th century. The best of the church's music from the past 2,000 years. LutheranPublicRadio.org The radio voice of the Lutheran faith for the 21st century. You're listening to Issues Etc. Are you living in central Iowa and longing for a church where the gospel is boldly confessed in all of its purity? Are you tired of hearing the latest purpose-driven how to live your best life now TED Talk? Are you desperate to hear the preaching of the cross which brings you and your children the knowledge, peace, and comfort of the gospel? Then come to Holy Cross Lutheran Church. Located in Carlisle, Iowa at the southeast corner of Des Moines, we're a short ride from everywhere in the city. Visit our website, holycrosscarlisle.org. Is your church celebrating a major anniversary soon? Ad Crucem can help with customized products to commemorate the event. We can create church banners, ornaments with an image of the church or your logo. We can even make stickers to hand out to members. We also recommend Kelly Schumacher create a painting of your church with matching greeting cards. Visit adcrucem.com and search for Church Anniversary for more details. That's A-D-C-R-U-C-E-M dot com. Academy serves Lutheran pastors and lay people to the ends of the earth through conferences, scholarly exchanges, and publications like the Logia Journal, the Confessional Lutheran Dogmatic Series, the works of Kurt Marquardt, and more. Find out more about this Confessional Lutheran worldwide mission outreach at lutheracademy.com. We're discussing growing up in Nazi Germany and communist East Germany with Dr. Uwe Simonetto. This is Issues Etc. I'm Todd Wilkin. Uwe, you mentioned this before, but why in particular did Adolf Hitler despise the city of Leipzig and its inhabitants? Well, because we were of such mixed race. As I said, Leipzig hosted the world's oldest international trade fair. And the reason 
because in Leipzig, the two, two major trade routes of antiquity crossed. In fact, they crossed right outside St. Thomas's Church, um, and St. Thomas Kirche, which is where Johann Sebastian Bach wrote most of his works for 27 years. So the trade routes by this, of course, the, that's, the, the, the fair went back much, much further, went back to, to 11th century or 12th century. The trade routes went, one went from Lisbon via Paris, Frankfurt, Leipzig, then on to Kiev and points east, and the other one from Rome via Vienna, Prague, Leipzig, and then points north. And they crossed right there. And so twice a year, in the springtime and in the fall, these big horse-drawn chucks of, with wares from all these countries, including, by the way, Chinese came there, and, and, and the Persians, and God knows what. It was really very, very international. And, of course, lots of Jews, because it was also the main fur center of Europe. They all came there. And do you know why it's the spring and fall? It's an interesting detail that I learned when I was in Leipzig studying this. Because in the spring and fall, you had slugs along the roadside, and the slugs was the only, were the only means of greasing your wagon wheels, your axles, because, of course, they didn't have petroleum in those days. So they stopped the, 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 those horse-drawn carriages and collected slugs along the wayside and, and uh, used, uh, had sacks full of slugs to uh, make the, 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 their vehicles run again. So... Obviously, these traders, foreign traders, encountered uh, lustily very beautiful Saxon women. They're famous for their, their beauty and uh, had a lot of kids there. And, and in fact, I remember even in the, early, uh, in the early war, there was a pub a few steps from our house that was run by a man called Hans Uni. He was Chinese, but he was sixth-generation Leipzig or something like that. There was a Chinese colony in Leipzig from centuries back, and there was a Persian colony in Leipzig, a Russian colony in Leipzig, and all that. So we were mixed. And my family is part of it. My, okay, my father was um, all very Nordic and Germanic, but my, my mother uh, looked very swarthy, and my my paternal grandparents, because we, we came originally from, uh, from Venice in the 16th century. These were Venetian Lutherans. They came, uh, they settled in Saxony when, when their leader, a man by the name of uh, Lupitano, was a Franciscan friar, uh, was drowned. And you had this mixed tribe. So had, uh, our women are gloriously glorious looking women because they are everything uh, uh, the dog from every village had left, lifted its leg against their family trees and to Hitler of course this was not racial purity nobody could be sure if they didn't have Jewish blood my mother for example was not allowed to go to university although she, she did her abitur her school, her high school certificate in the best girls school in, in Germany with straight A's, and she was second only in her class. She wasn't because she didn't have, according to the university, she didn't have national socialist leadership qualities. You know, these, the, this is how we knew, of course, about the Nazis, and they weren't very, uh, certainly in, in our circles, not very popular, in addition to which we had part Jewish relatives, we had uh, I had an uncle Felix von Bressensdorf. He was well converted to he was Christian, was a very, very uh, devout Lutheran. But Uncle Felix, my mother gave home house concerts every Friday, and uh, Uncle Felix um, always arrived late and left early. And when I asked my mother why. Uh, well, he didn't want to be noticed. Of course, he he, he had to wear the the J and the Star of David and a J on his lapel, but he, on top of which he wore an overcoat, and and so he hit he hit that. But he came regularly to our concerts every week, 
uh, until one day he stayed away. And then when I when I asked where Uncle Felix was, my mother said, "Well, the family have hidden him, uh, sent him to uh, to uh, Mecklenburg. Mecklenburg is now a northeastern state of Saxony. It far belonged then to Prussia." But uh, there is a saying about Mecklenburg. Bismarck was once asked what he would do if he knew the world were coming to an end tomorrow, and he said he'd move to Mecklenburg because everything happens 50 years later there. And so therefore, Nazi, National Socialism had not reached Mecklenburg at all, and those farmers uh, hit many Jews, and, or half-Jews, you were equally threatened if you, were, if you were baptized or if only one of your parents were Jewish. They hit them in their barns and declared them as farm workers, and the Nazis didn't expect anybody Jewish working in Mecklenburg fields. And so that was that. So you see, this, these are first impressions of Nazism in, in, in Germany. We're talking about growing up in Nazi Germany and communist East Germany with Dr. Uwe Sibonetto, author of the new book, Urchin at War, the tale of a Leipzig rascal and his Lutheran granny under bombs in Nazi Germany. When we come back, we'll hear more about his childhood before and during the war. Thanks to our beloved on-demand listeners, Issues Etc. consistently ranks among the top podcasts in religion and spirituality. You can help us climb the charts by subscribing, rating, and reviewing Issues Etc. Type Issues Etc. in your podcast provider, hit the subscription button, and leave us a five-star review. This will make it easier for podcast listeners to find Issues Etc. Help us cast Christ's net on the internet. Subscribe, rate, and review Issues Etc. today. Have you ever attended a funeral and not known what to say? Or perhaps you did think of something to say and it was the wrong thing to say? Funerals are a regular part of life. As you age, they become even more common as your friends and family members pass through the veil of death. The September issue of The Lutheran Witness will help you think through funerals, your own and the others you attend. It will guide you through what to say at a funeral and how to plan your own. To purchase a copy, visit cph.org witness. To learn more about The Lutheran Witness, visit our website, witness.lsms.org. The Lutheran Witness, helping you interpret the world from a Lutheran perspective. Did you know that Luther Academy has been providing continuing education for confessional Lutheran pastors and laypeople worldwide for more than 20 years? Luther Academy publishes Logia, the Confessional Lutheran Dogmatic Series, and Luther Digest. Find out more about Luther Academy and sign up to receive their free email newsletter at lutheracademy.com. lutheracademy.com and like them on Facebook. facebook.com slash lutheracademy. Remember when education was about the fundamental skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic? And about reading great literature and studying history to give our kids a model for what it is to be a good person. Memoria Press's Classical Christian Curriculum offers that very model for your homeschool. Get $5 off your next order by using the coupon code LPR21. For more information, go to memoriapress.com. Memoria Press, saving Western civilization one student at a time. Education and edification. You're listening to Issues Etc. Thanks to the following congregations for standing with us by becoming an Issues Etc. congregational sponsor. Bethlehem Lutheran, North Zulch, Texas. Faith Lutheran, Rogue River, Oregon. Grace Lutheran, Warmister, Pennsylvania. Emmanuel Lutheran, Pensacola, Florida. Mount Olive Lutheran, Duluth, Minnesota. Pilgrim Lutheran, Kilgore, Texas. Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran, Rathdrum, Idaho. St. Matthew Lutheran, Hawthorne Woods, Illinois. The Good Shepherd Lutheran, Inglewood, California. And Zion Lutheran, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Find out how your confessional Lutheran church can support this worldwide outreach by including Issues Etc. in your mission or advertising budget. Just go to issuesetc.org, click Support, Donate, and print the one-page flyer. When your congregation becomes an Issues Etc. sponsor, we'll publicize your church on the radio, at our website, and in the Issues Etc. journal. You have to weigh the argument for its soundness and validity. And you can't just dismiss it because you don't like the gender of the person making the argument. When you separate those two things, then you create a second baptism. But Paul's very clear in the book of Ephesians that there's one Lord, one faith, 
one baptism, and one God and Father of all. And I think it's a completely mistaken understanding of what Lutheranism is. It's almost like giving in to the caricature, right? The caricature is, well, you guys call yourselves Lutherans because you just follow Luther, believe whatever he says. And, but it's almost like this is a buying into that caricature. We're talking about a huge transfer of wealth from the poor of today to the far less poor, indeed, to the wealthy of tomorrow. We're, we're, we're asking the poor of today to sacrifice for the rich of tomorrow. In about an hour, we'll play Issues Etc. Soundbite of the Week. Those four soundbites you will hear in their entirety. And after you've heard them, you vote by giving us a call, one 623 my ie You can vote in advance at talkback at issuesetc.org. That's our email address or our Twitter address at issuesetc. Or go to our Facebook fan page and vote for the soundbites there. Facebook.com slash issuesetc. In the meantime, we're talking about growing up in Nazi Germany and communist East Germany with Dr. Uwe Simonetto. Uwe, if you would, describe your childhood in a little more detail before and during the war. Well, before the war, no, but before the war, I can. The war started when I was nine, I was three. All I remember before the war was absolutely glorious. I had wonderful summer holidays at the Baltic Sea. We were not rich, but we were well-to-do. Uh, and so we went to the Baltic Sea, Swinemünde, which is now part of Poland. And we had fabulous, fabulous vacations there. We had fun. I must tell you something about the Swinemünde, because the year, just months before the war started, a picture of me in that book, Urchin at War, of me riding the shoulders of a stranger. It was an English Baptist pastor. It was uh, later in America, these people would be called peaceniks. He had come with a delegation of British blinded war veterans, and uh, he wanted to persuade the Germans to, to remain peaceful, which, of course, was rather illusory. But I was his shoulder. I remember that. My father sought out the company of the British because he was extremely Anglophile, so much so that later, when we were taken to uh, an armed forces day to Wehrmacht Kaserne to practice target shooting on, on what we called pub camarades, and these were cardboard cutouts representing Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt, and my father always said, well, you can aim at Churchill, you can uh, aim at Roosevelt, but the fat guy with a cigar, that one you don't shoot at. Anyway, we had, we played in the streets. I mean, my mother was rather fancy. She dollied me up. I, I looked rather ridiculous for a street kid, you know, because we, we bombarded each other with horse droppings and uh, snowballs or other things. And I mean, I walked out in the street in a white shirt, and the white shirt was covered with dirt within the first hour. And that was the uh, uh, the thing. But we had fun. We had, uh, we had, it was a very, Saxons are, have a marvelous sense of humor, and the kids had a greater sense of humor. And we weren't violent. We didn't hit each other. We, we pulled jokes, practical jokes on, on us. We'll, I hope you'll find time to discuss those, especially during a bombing later. But we, we, had, we had good fun, good, harmless fun as children. I was raised very strictly to manners. I mean, uh, yesterday I uh, told somebody how I was at the age of six trained to kiss ladies' hands when we had guests for example, for our concerts or so, and I stood there and I had to bow to the ladies and kiss their hands. And um, we, I was compelled to address everybody in high German and not this ridiculous Saxon dialect, which I much preferred. Uh, we were, I was raised very strictly in table manners, how to hold knife and fork, uh, not to talk to uh, until I've spoken to, never to sit down until the last female in the room had sat down. All these things uh, were standard. And uh, I'm, I tell you what, uh, Todd, I'm still very grateful for this education, this upbringing, 
because it, uh, it served me very well later in life as I traveled around the world, because uh, this way I was immediately accepted in France or in Italy or elsewhere, where the same manners prevailed. So that was before the war started. And now the war, and if you want to ask me about that, is where it start. I, I remember I was barely three, but I have a, an incredible long-term memory. That was on a Sunday in September 1939, and my mother had laid out a coffee table on our lodger. We had a huge lodger outside her, our living room, the salon, and, and very comfortable. She served coffee for herself, of course, and, her, and my father. And, and my grandmother visited us every day and she cocoa for me. And there was a wonderful bunch of flowers on the table. And we were waiting for my father to begin eating. Standard fare, I remember, was a typical standard fare in Leipzig for occasions like that. is cheesecake, poppy seed cake, and crumble cake. So these things. And then my father came out, grim phrased out of his study, having listened to the BBC early afternoon news. Now my father, by the way, this, this was a crime. I mean, you, especially if you talked about, especially if you were an official, if you talked about listening to enemy broadcasts, you could go to a concentration camp or even be beheaded. So my father came out with a grim face saying, we are at war. That is after Britain and France had declared war on Germany after Germany had invaded Poland. And my, my mother, who was exceedingly ditzy, very educated and very, very beautiful, exceedingly beautiful, but she was ditzy beyond belief. She said, but uh, Karl Heinz, as long as we have such beautiful flowers. Well, Karl Heinz, her husband, my father, couldn't see the flowers, but he, could see, he knew because, precisely because he, he knew what war meant, because he lost his eyesight. And every day, every month, shrapnel, all his life, shrapnel popped out of his skin. I mean, he was, since, since he was wounded, he had shrapnel coming out of his body until his very end. So that was, that's what, how I remember the beginning of the war. And then my father, my mother uh, sent me downstairs to play with the nanny in the, in the street and my kids. And she filled the um, bathtub with water. And very curiously enough, and I had a red, you know, you had these marvelous pedal cars, you know. And mine was red, fire engine red. And at the same time, 700 miles west of us, a young girl called Julian was pedaling in Southampton in the pedal car while her mother filled her bathtub with water in case the Luftwaffe would come that very night and bomb the living daylights out of Southampton, which ultimately the Luftwaffe did as the Royal Air Force bombarded us. So, I mean, there are interesting parallels. Dr. Uwe Simonetto is a native of Germany. He's former religion editor for United Press International. He's founder and emeritus director of the Center for Lutheran Theology and Public Life and author of the new book, Urchin at War, The Tale of a Leipzig Rascal and His Lutheran Granny Under Bombs in Nazi Germany. When you use the link at our website, a percentage of your purchase will support the worldwide outreach of Issues Etc. Just go to issuesetc.org, click Talk On Demand Archives, and look for Urchin at War by Uwe Simonetto. Uwe, thank you very much. Thank you. Next time with Dr. Uwe Simonetto, we will pick up the story with his summer in a pro-Nazi parsonage in 1944.
Church music directors can find a new community at Prelude to Postlude, the CPH Music blog. Learn helpful tips for managing music ministry and involving members, and meet the composers of some of your favorite new pieces. Plus, find suggestions of music to use for special services, and preview some of our newest works with free samples you can use at your church. Visit us at preludetopostlude.org. In all things, across the nation, children are back in over 1,800 Lutheran schools. Students are thriving in programs of excellence in safe, caring, Christian environments taught by dedicated teachers. To find a school in your community, visit lcms.org schools. Contact a school today for information about a Lutheran school for the children in your family. That's lcms.org schools. Your lifeline to the Lutheran worldview. You're listening to Issues Etc. Truth, freedom, and vocation are the pillars of a Concordia University Chicago education. Through them, we form our students for lives of influence and service for the common good. This is the education American society needs right now. I'm Dr. Russell Don, president of Concordia Chicago, and I invite you to visit us to discover what it means for truth, freedom, and vocation to become the pillars of your future. Learn more at cuchicago.edu. For your next family vacation, consider Our Beach House, a charming three-bedroom vacation rental on beautiful Siesta Key. Just off Sarasota, Florida, Siesta Key Beach, consistently voted America's best, is just 100 steps away. Whether you're watching the sunset over the Gulf of Mexico or frolicking in the warm surf, you and your family will fall in love with Siesta Key. Check us out at SiestaKeyRentalGenie.com or call Virginia at 941-266-1858.